anything less would be civilized. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, we are back here for the first episode of Retro Wave that we have done in 15 months. I know you guys thought that the show was over, that I had completely given up on it. You are right, but guess what? I recently decided to bring it back because you know what? There's a whole lot of things that came up from our childhood that I don't think uh, gave the proper attention, and we have the platform to do it here. So I wanted to start off by resurrecting this show and going into great details about some of the things that have been talked about over the last uh, few weeks that we can bring to light from our perspective. And I got a lovely cast of people joining me here for this show we got some people faces that you may know some faces that you probably don't know and then some faces in between let's go ahead and introduce our good buddy orange hat who's joining us for this uh shindig tonight how are you doing tonight orange doing good doing good and right next to him uh long-suffering mets fan big old mets is joining us for this show how are you doing today man well I, i'm suffering because the mets lost yesterday but i'm on the show today so it's good Yep. It's speaking of long suffering, our long suffering uh Niners fan right below him, right there, right down over there, our good buddy Eddie Brock. How you doing there, Eddie? I woke up for this. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> a great sacrifice is greatly appreciated. And, and somebody else who also woke up for this, someone who we haven't seen in a little bit, our good buddy Cole Casa Cage. How you doing? Hello, man. Happy to be here. It's been a minute, so catching up is always nice. And before before I uh, profile here, are, are you wearing in fact a Nickelodeon t shirt yes, right yes, now? I am. Yes, yes. <laughs> that is awesome. Simp. I'm not at all ashamed. <laughs> it is what it is. And of course, our good buddy from Bounding in the Comics, Dante. How you doing? I'm doing all right, sir. How are you? Doing very well. So for the context of, of this episode, because what I wanted to do, we're going to break this into a few other episodes throughout the course of the next few weeks. But obviously, there's been a lot of talk about uh, Nickelodeon for the last couple of weeks and not for uh, great reasons. And people are starting to realize a lot of things that were going on behind the scenes with Nickelodeon. But I think why it, that series was so impactful with a lot of today's youth is because their concept of Nickelodeon, their idea of Nickelodeon only really started in like the 2000s, right? So their first memory of what Nickelodeon was was shows like Drake and Josh and iCarly and maybe Zoe 101 shows in like that era so they have absolutely no concept of a Nickelodeon that existed before Dan Schneider and for people who grew up in our age range obviously we remember a completely different Nickelodeon than the ones that they grew up with like I think I may have stopped watching Nickelodeon by the time it got to the late 90s and that was around the time that Mr. Snyder had actually started growing more power in the company but my concept of what Nickelodeon was during this time frame was a completely different um, uh, era and a completely different set of circumstances there and what I want to do for this uh, segment is that I want to focus on the game shows of Nickelodeon because for me personally watching these Nickelodeon game shows growing up in the early 90s for some of you guys maybe even the late 80s all the way to the mid 90s this was my bread and butter like this is the shows that kept me watching for a lot longer period than I probably should have 
but it was watching the, these shows with these games and i think we all kind of envisioned ourselves being on these shows at one point in time uh during this time period so i'm gonna go ahead and give a quick little discussion here for you guys before i go ahead and set this whole thing up um orange hat i'll start with you what do you remember the most about uh nickelodeon game shows so you can kind of talk about the era of nickelodeon that you remember watching uh versus obviously what it's become uh over the last few years uh, from what I remember, I remember the Hidden Temple show. I remember Double Dare, Guts, uh, Figure It Out. I loved all those shows because they were great time passers. They were good fun to watch. Uh, I barely remember any of the substance in the shows. I mean, I do remember there was the show. I think it was Figure It Out where uh, people got slimed. Yeah. And... Um, there was or it was such a fun thing i mean legends of the hidden temple it's like who the fuck is doing how did they get the damn thing to talk you know <laughs> but, uh, i mean that was back when i was a don't kid, don't man. watch I, that show high do not watch that show high you will mess you up <laughs> I know, right? um, now i'm gonna do it but then oh, yeah, no. then there was also the other shows uh doug freaking rugrats in them but uh the game shows those were the ones that i mostly remember the or from childhood. All right. Hey, Biggles, you talked about this a little bit before we went live here. You had uh, connections to someone who had connections to this era of Nickelodeon that we're specifically going to talk about here. And you almost made it on one of these shows. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how that came to be. Good to be. Yeah. So a man I called uncle when I was younger, cause he was my best friend's uncle. And I, I saw him every weekend and he had connections at Nickelodeon. He was an acting coach and he had a lot of people in uh, these type of shows. Like some of them were actually on some of these shows. And by the time I had met him, uh, I think the last game show had just ended. So it's like I couldn't get on. Um, and I almost uh, did got into acting to go to Nickelodeon because he had connections and thank goodness I didn't because uh, that would have been bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> but all these, like I'm a, I'm a little younger than a lot of you guys. Uh, I was still born in the eighties, but I'm still, uh, still a little younger. So like, I didn't start watching like Nickelodeon until I was like five and I watched all these game shows, not realizing that only like one of them was still new and then the yeah. rest of them were gone. Like, I remember Wild and Crazy Kids, which was basically like oh, yeah. a game show where you were at camp uh, and you were doing camp events. And I wanted to be on that one so bad. And I think it ended in like 92. So I was like three. And I, <laughs> so I didn't even get to do any of those. But yeah, I remember the game shows the most because I wanted to be on them so bad. And then they were all over by the time I was like old enough to be on them. Yep. So it kind of sucked. It's, it's some of us weren't even fit enough to be on these game shows yet. We still <laughs> wanted to be on them anyway. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eddie, what, what was your fond memories of uh, early day Nickelodeon? Oh man, I, I'm I'm probably old enough to remember actually growing up with Nickelodeon from preschool. Like I remember watching. I remember being in like uh, you know kindergarten or whatever, and you the teacher puts on Nickelodeon and you watch Eureka's Castle. And you watch a couple of, you know, all these like really, really baby kind of things. But then later on, around the two o'clock time slot, you start getting into Wild and Crazy Kids. And you start getting into Double Dare and you start getting into uh, Legends of the Hidden Temple. And Nick Arcade was probably my favorite just because of the concept of going inside of a video game was such a cool idea. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I I never thought about actually getting on the shows. I remember watching guts and thinking that i like i was like really into american gladiators so watching guts mm -hmm. was like oh yeah i could definitely do this and then i realized now that, that crag or whatever it was called a giant crane or whatever <laughs> would have kicked the crap out of me I, no oh thanks. yeah i would have needed oxygen like halfway in it's like there's no uh, way i'm getting up there bring, in, like, bring, out, the guys, bring out ooga booga or whatever her, the people's name are <laughs> 
Now, Cassie, you're a little bit younger than the rest of the crowd here. I don't know how old Biggles thinks we are. I think we're like the same age. But anyway, but I know you're just a little bit younger than everyone else here. So you may have a different understanding of what Nickelodeon was. So what was your concept of like th these old shows that we're kind of talking about here? And what did you what was your uh, initial thoughts growing up watching Nickelodeon at the time? Well, um, a lot of the shows like um, Legends of the Hidden Temple, for example, kind of I, I believe they had them like a, on a separate channel. So I used to watch them as um, essentially like reruns. So that was my go to. I, I used to enjoy watching them all the same, just that I caught them a little later than everyone else. But that didn't bother me as like, you know, a five, 10 year old idiot that <laughs> didn't know shit anyway. So um, that didn't bother me at all. I do remember watching some of Nick Arcade. But that was when I was really, really young. Uh, I had to be like four. Um, I I more so caught stuff like Slime Time Live. Um, I remember that. what else? Uh, that that was fun. That was like I don't remember if it was like Friday nights or Saturday nights that Nickelodeon pretty much had on on lock with you know all that and stuff. But Slime Time Live would be involved in that too. So I used to love catching that. Um, I more so caught like Double Dare Two Thousand, which I really enjoyed. I thought that was cool. That that I don't I don't think that was necessarily like reruns or whatever. But um, I used to watch all that sh that stuff all the same. Just I'd just catch it, you know, <laughs> a few years after everyone else. But nonetheless, I enjoyed them. They were fun. Um, I wanted to be like one of those kids that you know would run through like I guess like those jungle gym aspect style you know things and whatnot. Um, I remember my mother used to take me to um to a place like that was sort of designed to be a little bit like that because um me and my brother had too much energy, so. <laughs> Um, she'd always take me to one of those places. They'd have some arcade games, but you'd also have like your indoor jungle gym sort of deal. And, you know, I used to definitely remember pretending that I was in one of those like events. Yeah, I think we all did at a certain point in time. And like I said, th this one goes back a little bit while before we uh, get into that. Our good buddy Dante, uh, what's your kind of reference of a Nickelodeon back during this time period? Oh, man. Yeah, I'm a 90s kid, and I remember a lot of kids from my generation being all about Disney and stuff like that. Nah, Nickelodeon was my jam. Even mm -hmm. from, like, yeah, like, the early age, like, you know, the late 80s uh, when they did syndicated stuff for, like, you know, the Saturday morning cartoons on CBS, Inspector Gadget, Garfield, The Littles. And then, uh, yeah, Guts, Double Dare, uh, What Would You Do? It was all hosted by that one guy. It was Mark Summers, I think his name yep. was. But yeah, he did all that stuff. He was pretty much, like, the you know, the, the, the host for all of it. But, uh, back then actually I was pretty active. I played football, baseball. So I definitely saw myself running through that shit, climbing that mountain. And, uh, you know, what would you do? Do all that. Even legends of the hidden temple. But, uh, not just that you talked about those Saturday night block snick. I was all about that back in the day. Yeah. Being, uh, all that. Are you afraid of the dark? Ren and Stimpy. Come on. Oh, yeah. Peak animation. But that not only that people, tend to forget nick at night when they would show like the old black and white oh, show, like yeah, yeah. alfred hitchcock uh stuff like that i Can love lucy yeah oh, yeah i used to catch that too yeah it'd be a lot of fun. yep but hell yeah, yeah. To, to me it was funny because as a kid when they started doing like the nick at night shows like that was kind of like the universal <laughs> like you know gunfire of like okay it's time to go to bed now like if you're still <laughs> up watching this show it's time <laughs> to go to bed. It's yeah. Like, same, yeah. same with uh mash Whenever that came out at four in the morning, I was like, oh, time to get to bed. Oh, absolutely. So <laughs> there's a lot of things that went on during this uh, time period here. So we want to go back just a little bit and kind of explain to you how we kind of set this whole thing up and how we got the ball rolling on what Nickelodeon eventually came to be. Because believe it or not, it wasn't just live action comedy. It wasn't just like the Nicktoons and stuff like that. They had to essentially start from the ground up. We're talking about the, the, the earlier days of cable television where they didn't really have much content, but they had a network. So they had to figure out, okay, how are we going to fulfill programming here? Well, in order to uh, not uh, have to pay so much money to rent uh, for studios outside of uh, their home location, they decided to open up their own studio in Orlando, Florida called Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando. And this is where the overwhelming majority of the core Nickelodeon shows that you guys love that are most fondly remembered were recorded at this studio. 
believe it or not, in the late 80s, when they first started recording things, I believe they were in a studio in Philadelphia at the time, but because they didn't have like the resources, you know, the, the budget and all that stuff to uh, use that studio full time, they was like, okay, the only way we're going to get any of this stuff done is to build our own homegrown studio. They built it in uh, at the Universal Studios uh, theme park in Orlando, and at its height, where we're talking about maybe mid-90s when they were like really raking in the dough, they had about 400 employees at Universal Studios here in Orlando, and it was raking in about $110 million, which adjusted for inflation is probably about $240 million today. And it was, this is a studio that is very, very fond in the memories and the hearts of a lot of uh, kids our age. And we'll talk about what exactly they did to it later on here. But this is the, the home where they started uh, producing a lot of these shows where it was live action, the video game shows. A lot of the uh, network um, production was done right out of this studio here. But at the early days, it was like, okay, well, we don't really know what we're going to be doing here. It's like, we, we know that we need to build some kind of audience, but we don't really have anything to present to them yet. So this is what I like to call the outlaw days of Nickelodeon game shows. This is where uh, producers and, and the writers were very, very desperate to have anything that would stick, and they would just throw anything they possibly could on the air. So here, here's a handful of shows that just shows you uh, how, how crazy that it got during this time period. Some of you guys, this is going back to the early sorry the late 80s so this is probably 1988 1989 some of you guys probably have never heard of some of these shows before which while we're bringing them to you now who has ever heard of the show called to uh, total panic show a total absolutely no nope. I, I remember the name yeah i've heard the name so this was a variety series that they did it was one of the first variety shows that they shot at nickelodeon in orlando and the show was originally hosted by molly uh molly scott and keith diamond and you could tell with, with this show it was like okay look we're initially going to run this show for three hours on sunday mornings and it didn't really have a set format week and week out because they literally had no idea what they were actually doing on there so it was like hey we got three hours this is our time frame do anything you can and see what sticks. So this is what the show ended up uh, releasing. This is just a little bit of a premiere here. They were actually talking about retro video games back during the, the late 80s. Like I said, they were trying to fill up TV time with anything that they possibly could. They had no format whatsoever. So here's a little bit of Total Panic from 1989. And we're trying to offer the newest and the best of what's available for, for game players in the uh, United States. What's it like being an editor of a magazine like that? Well, it's a lot of fun. I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty glamorous as far as being able to play all the new game systems yeah. like you're going to see here today. Um, and we have people all around the country who write about the games, very knowledgeable people. Some of them create games, so they know the inside tips on, on the game systems. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was looking at the magazine, one of the things that really caught my eye were these maps that mapped out an entire video game. And, and I thought that would be great, you know, so I could play it better. But I also wondered, doesn't that kind of give away the game, or what is, what is it for? Some people say it gives away the game, but at the same time, the games are so complex, they're so difficult these days. To put a map in the game, which are very popular, the uh, people love to see the maps, it shows you different parts that you might get hung up on, and uh, it, it becomes less discouraging. A game that you might have put on the shelf because it was too hard, you can get past a section that you were having trouble with before with the maps. Oh, you, so you can move up a level by using oh, the map. Oh, that's, means, that's really yeah. neat. Great. Andy, we have all this. So, so one of the things that you're noticing here just for this segment alone is that they were like, okay, what do kids actually like? And yeah. you had a bunch of people try, trying to figure out, it's like, how, how are we gonna get kids to like, actually like watch like this network? Like, what can we present them? Cause like I said, they didn't have Doug, they didn't have Rugrats, they didn't have Arcade, they didn't have any of these things. Like this is what I'm talking about quite literally the outlaw days of cable. This is the outlaw days of Nickelodeon where they're just throwing anything at the wall that they thought could possibly stick here. So this show was known for doing like music videos. They did uh, film reviews. They would have special guests from all over uh, the realm of 80s popularity anyone from hulk hogan to richard simmons to uh, roger sharp anyone who they thought that that kids I, I guess uh either ages what 10 to 15 might actually care about they put them on this show the show lasted roughly about uh, a year i think it was a, a total year that this show uh went on maybe a little bit over that time period but this is i guess their way of trying to figure out okay we have something here. We don't exactly know what it is. We know we have a core audience. We just need to give them something that they would actually turn and enjoy here. And it was like, hey, look, kids like video games, right? And we got this brand new uh, console called the Sega Genesis coming out. Kids will certainly love this whole thing. So it's this is wild the because I um, love, I love it's, it's, Diamond rocking out that mullet. I was about to say his pink yeah. shirt is mullet. Yeah, he knows what kids want. 
<laughs> oh yeah, like you, you oh, can no. tell that this is just like 80s, like all together. It's like the hairstyles, the, the video games. It's like, oh yeah, to tell us about this new gaming console, the Sega Dreamcast. So, is, is it going to be the future of video or, games? Or, or like, the state of the art in gaming, the Power Glove, because that was useful for any game. Oh God, no! It's well, interesting actually, to yeah. see the comparison between how Nickelodeon was trying to handle things and how Cartoon Network was, because Cartoon Network just entirely re- relied on like. Hanna Barbera, Hanna Barbera's catalog for years yeah. before they got yep. their own stuff. Yep. So to mm-hmm. see like Nickelodeon trying to do their thing in comparison, dude, it's really different. Um, considering they're like it, the top two Cartoon Networks of the you know of the time. And then that's how cable was for for the most part, especially like during the nineties, because like I said, a lot of these networks were pretty new and fresh, and they didn't have like their own content to rely on in this time period. So look, you kind of look at it in the modern sense of like these streaming services. It's like, yeah, okay, we got a streaming service, we really don't have anything to present to people outside of things that have already existed. So how do we come up with our own like new content? So people were looking at all these other networks to see what they were doing. It's like, hey, these guys are doing really well with game shows and stuff like that, and cartoons. Like we need to do our own cartoons. Try to catch up with them so there was actually like a sense of competition and that competition drove creativity during this time period because it was like hey look we need to beat uh, our our competitors so this is around the time where like people act they had the mindset during this time period of hey we need to actually create something that fans are actually going to like and they weren't trying to drive away their already established audience because they didn't have an already established audience so I want to play this real quick part two because I think this is the introduction of, of the Game Boy. Keep in mind, not the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy. Going back even further than that, so this is this is this is what was called brand spanking new video games uh, during this time period. Can to play this for us and then give us kind of your review at the end? Okay. All right. Here we go. You get. Can you get started and everything right there? Okay. He's got that going. Now, this is the one I love. Yes. <laughs> this this little guy. What is this? That's Tell the Nintendo that. Game Boy. The and name Nintendo is no, you know, it's not, it's, it's familiar to everybody who plays right. video games because they're very popular yeah. now. Yeah. But this is their portable game system. It's called the Game Boy. Right. And uh, uh, it's, unlike older handheld games, they aren't limited to one single game. Yeah. Again, like a Nintendo uh, home system, they have cartridges that you can plug into the Game Boy right. that let you play different games. Uh, Super Mario Land, break, uh, Alleyway is a breakout kind of game, brick breaking, uh, baseball, tennis, and Tetris. Now, I do remember some some little things like this we used to have back in school. I think you played football or soccer. Right. right. What's the difference between this and those? The cartridges are the key because you can change games. The older games were limited to the football game. Right. You'd buy it. You were stuck playing the football. If right. you wanted to play you golf, you had to buy another machine. So but this one, you can play all those games. I remember all those, too. All the games that are available right. by, by using the same. Now, this right. thing is really light. This this is the yeah. whole bit. There, that's there's, the whole that's thing. it. That's, that's all you need. That's the whole need. thing. It's, uh, it's right. going to be about $90. The cartridges mm-hmm. will be about $25. Okay. And it'll be a lot of the familiar wow. games that you've seen seen on the Nintendo Entertainment System. There'll be Castlevania-like uh, games. Wait, wait. Hey, there, there was a time period where we didn't spend $500 on a new console. I have a completely uh, corrupted <laughs> to this. <laughs> what, what time portal did I find myself in right here? And I think batteries, Genesis. That thing was like a brick. Yeah, Genesis oh, yeah, was like, what, 200 bucks when it dropped? Well, I think, I think so. they're talking about the Genesis here. So, yeah, maybe we can yeah. see how much it was. Then. All right. Let's go on with it. Hey, look, why don't we check out this one? It's been singing at me since you walked out here. What is the noise? And uh, what, what's this one called? Okay, this is the Sega Genesis. Uh, Sega is a familiar name. They already have their Sega Master System out. Again, this is their next generation video game machine. Uh, it's a 16-bit machine, which is a lot stronger. By the way, just real quick, I absolutely love, like, the, the, the TV that they're showing here that looks like an old, like, 80s, like, computer. Like, no, this is what... <laughs> Ooh, this CRG. Is what, like an old Apple computer. <laughs> yeah, 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 this is what miniature televisions like looked like back then. Like, I love how dated oh all this stuff is. You see how advanced it is? It has a speaker mm-hmm. on the side. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That was a feature. Yeah. That was a feature back then. Yep. <laughs> uh, in computing power than the previous machines were, it too will be just Are under $200. Wow. And the games come on cartridges similar to a Nintendo or the Sega Master System. Right. And uh, it allows you to play, again, arcade quality games in your home. Uh, special components that you would get with this? With the Genesis, you get the Genesis game controller pad. Right. And uh, Altered Beast, arcade. a familiar arcade game um, that has been translated to the Genesis in high quality. We played that one. That yeah. is, that's wild, isn't it? <laughs> it is. uh, what, what I was wondering, what are, the, what are the features of this system? What, what kind of things will it do? Well, again, similar to the Turbo Graphics, it's a ne- next generation machine in that the graphics are impeccable, almost like a painting, and, and just like what you'd see in the arcade in yeah. your home. 
Uh, and the sound, it contains a lot of digitized sounds where they, they take an actual voice and record it and turn it into a computer program. So you hear actual voices on the screen telling you to uh, run this way or grab a power up or you're safe at home base or something like that. Now, I was wondering, I, I, I read somewhere that you're able to hook this one up to somebody else's. So you right. could get a couple of people, or how, how does that work? Right, there'll be a telegenesis modem. A okay. modem is a connection between two computers over a telephone, uh -huh. and you'll be able to play across town or across the country, across the world so like with Greg another player. So like Greg and I player. could be in each at home, and then we could call each other on the phone and both play at the same time. By all means, we play baseball <laughs> from across town. Oh, that would be, oh, that'd be wild. Well, you told us before, but how much does it cost <laughs> for this again? Just under $200, and mm -hmm. again, the cartridges will be similarly priced, about $30, $40. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, are these cartridges compatible with the 8-bit system, isn't that the, that was the pre, prelude to this Unfortunately not, because these are the next generation game machines. Okay. There will be an adapter called the Power Base Converter, okay. which you can plug into your Genesis, which will allow you to play Sega Master System games on your Genesis. Again, there won't be any improvement in quality, but all those games that you've got saved up in the library, you can use them on the Genesis. You can use them on They were so like far ahead of the time, and they didn't even know it. And I, I wish I had like a little yeah. bit of a time to talk about. Remember the Sega Channel, like as well. The okay. Sega Channel was essentially back during the, the uh, '90s. There was a time period where you can. Uh, well, I think the subscription was only like 13 bucks a month at the time, mm -hmm. but you can you can get like 50 um, Sega Genesis games. I think they all like rotate like every single month, but you get access to 50 games anytime you you possibly like wanted to and. Think of it as, like I said, look at modern days, the Xbox subscription, the PlayStation subscription, Steam subscription. They were doing that like back in like the early 90s, right? They didn't exactly have, uh, let's say, the, the, the system and the kind of the hardware to make it all work. But the idea was like already there back then and, and generated before, but the Sega Dreamcast. So but even before like the CD branded games, they were already doing this stuff, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. And the best part about that Sega channel is that you can get great exclusives like the Mega Man Wily Wars. That was the only way you can get Mega Man Wily Wars on the Genesis was through oh, the yeah. Genesis channel, the Sega channel. My parents wouldn't get that for me. I know. I, I had it at, for I had it, it for like a few five months. Years to convince me to get them the internet. I, I had uh, the Sega channel for a few months, and then like after about three or four months, I lost it, never got it back. And then obviously by that point, mm -hmm. like, Sega was dead. So it was like there was no point of like, getting it back there. But I remember like going back to, because I think it was like financial issues at the time. And then I go back, it was like it was 13 bucks a month. It was like, wait, it was 13 bucks a month and we lost our Sega channel? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's less than like an Amazon Prime subscription like now. I love, like, yeah. I love you, Bill Clinton. I was salty exactly. about it when my I parents mean, said no, but like that Christmas, I quickly got over it when I got a Super Nintendo and better games. Nice. Yeah, oh, I yeah. think um, back then, people were so like not interested in recurring like charges. My parents were so against all that stuff. I remember I wanted like the spy set um, from this like book that my school used to give us to order books from, and they would pretty much regularly send like new things to your house every month. Um, I managed to get my parents to like, you know, buy it for me. And then they didn't realize that it, they would send oh, me new stuff house. every single month. And they were so pissed about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Columbia house is the bane of every child. Oh. I can get close CDs I mean, for a penny, mom. I know, right? I couldn't do that either. Like, what was it? 10 movies for 10 bucks. And I collect right. the VHS like crazy. I, I think that was marketed yeah. specifically towards kids who didn't understand the concept of like hidden fees. It was like, yeah. but it says it's only 12 cents. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you think about it now, back then, 190 bucks was, or it was or it cost for a Sega. You look at a Sega now, the original Sega, it's like twice that mm -hmm. because it's a freaking antique. <laughs> yep. I mean, that's and like I said, uh, talking about a time period where new consoles were under 200 bucks. It's like I said, it's unheard mm -hmm. of considering our modern times. Well, right. it's the same price if you think about it, it's just inflation. Uh, even, even then, I think it's still they, they no, I mean, like quite a lot. I, I know what you're saying, but it's like, no, 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 I mean, the Sega that he's talking about it being an antique. No, it's the same price, it's just inflation. Oh, but, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, yeah. It's the same price. <laughs> Wasn't PlayStation One also about 200 bucks? Yeah, it two, uh, yeah, yeah, they literally uh, made much. that your selling point. Uh, you know, I was spoiled. I was too young to understand the concept of money. I just wanted things. Right. <laughs> like, exactly. I was an old child back then. <laughs> yeah. like, face I was like, what do you mean we can't like, have this? I wanted no. this money shit that my, you're talking about. Give me a goddamn PlayStation. 
<laughs> my dad always did this thing where he'd always tell me like, no, you're not getting that. No, like my parents kind of conducted themselves sort of on the cusp of being Amish besides the television and cable. Um, yeah. So me, like I begged for a Game Boy Color. My dad said, no, you're not getting that. You know, kids out there have that stuff, but you're not going to have that. But he would come up like Santa would come up with it for Christmas. Like he'd always pretend that I was never getting that just so he could surprise me. And I'd be absolutely shocked out of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so as you can That's see here parenting there <laughs> hell yeah there you go so what you can see here is that you know in the early days of the nickelodeon they're throwing everything out the wall they're trying to see figure out what works somebody came up with the brilliant idea and i do use brilliant as quotation marks it's like hey you know what that jeopardy show that seems to be pretty popular what if we were to do jeopardy with children and this is one of the earlier examples of a game show called make the grade now this is a show that sure debuted that. in uh 1989 mm -hmm. only lasted a little over a year uh it was roughly uh, a one-shot deal they had like three seasons quote unquote with a few episodes but a lot of them were kind of front loaded so they was like okay well hey let's get a bunch of quote unquote smart kids on here and put them on a game show and just see how, how smart they can truly be so you can see here oh, the concept oh uh, yeah it's <laughs> yeah. me when i was a kid <laughs> oh yeah we're going we're going way back with this one but so the concept here is that, hey, look, here's a bunch of uh, different topics, categories, history, music, science. And we're going to actually really, really smart kids to see if you can figure out how this works here. So uh, you see we got discount Phil Lamar uh, here as the host of this show, because like I said, they don't really know <laughs> what they're doing just quite yet. But yeah, here's the concept of yeah. a big degree. Oh, well, good luck to you. And thanks for being with us. Next, we have Megan in the green square. <laughs> That's <laughs> definitely <laughs> These kids with their fucking Maybe glasses and blank expressions. Maybe you were recently in an OM competition. Like you never now, what is an OM me. competition? Um, it's really like you create, you write your own plays, and you make your own props and costumes, and then you compete against other teams. Oh, I see. What is the OM uh, 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 for? I'll be a little bit nice here. I kind of miss dorky kids like this. Like the, the kids yeah. nowadays are just like just little shits. <laughs> <laughs> and they speak proper I English. I see of the mind. Here, right? I see of the mind. No, you, you wrote some plays yourself. Mm -hmm. What was your play about? Um, Lou Castell lost his sense of humor, and so he hired a detective to go and help him find one. Oh, really? Did he ever find <laughs> one? I like that idea. That's cool. Yeah, that's make that a movie. Okay. Lou Castello. Mm. Would you like too. to uh, make writing their career someday? Lou Castello. No, <laughs> no just as fine. Huh? What, do you, what would you like to uh, do then? Some kind of doctor. Oh. oh, okay. I see how those two uh, connect there. Writing, doc, no. <laughs> well, good luck to you, whatever you want to do. And thanks for being with us. Last and certainly not least, we have Frank in the Blue Square. Who was just ahead? Frank, you're <laughs> in the school. Yes. What events do you run? I run in two miles and 10K. Ten, ten, ten kilometers? Yes. You run 10 kilometers? Yeah. <laughs> That's a long How distance. How far is that in American? 46 minutes. Oh my god. 46 minutes. And you're only how old? 12. Boy, what do you eat for breakfast, man? <laughs> hey, <laughs> have some Wheaties. Power food there. Would you like to uh, uh, like be in the Olympics someday? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah? If Fine. I make it. If you make it. Well, at the rate you're going, you're definitely going to make it there. Well, good luck to you and thanks for being with us. Good luck to all of you. Let's talk about how the game is played. As you can see, our board has seven subjects and seven grade levels. I can you tell this is the be? 80s. They did not no. have uh, the graphics Today, down. <laughs> music, yeah. the arts, home uh, economics, current events, and foods. It's going to be our special lecture today, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, in order to win the game, you must answer at least one question in each subject and one in each grade level. Now, you can do that in any pattern that you desire, whether it be diagonally, randomly, or straight across and up and down. If you're the first one to do that, then you win $500 and go on to the honors no. round where you have a chance at another $600 and a great grand prize. So gotta, but first, so before we get there to all those jobs. prizes and, and money, I'm going to tell you guys behind some of those question squares, we've hidden some wild cards, and some of those include the famous Make the Great Fire Drill, which so you know, is, basically the like, is basically Jeopardy. Like, this is basically Jeopardy. So it's just a little precautionary measure there. Nothing to be afraid of, though. Uh, in the meantime, we have Megan in the green square. You've won the right to go first. So pick a square and get it started. I'll make the grade. Um, math for 11. Math for 11 is going to kick it off. Good luck to all of you. In one week, how many different times is it 7 o'clock? Who cares? Okay, Megan? 14. 14 times is correct. 
That's the mother smarter than me. Okay, so, Megan. Go ahead. She just looks like she's going to win all uh, this shit. P.E. for eighth. Phys Ed, eighth grade. Which is biggest, a softball, a baseball, or a golf ball? Okay, Megan. Softball. A softball is the biggest, yes. All right, Megan, go ahead. You're in control. Uh, music for ninth. Music ninth. In a classical music piece, which comes first, the cadenza, the prelude, or the coda? Okay, Megan. Prelude. The prelude. Yes. So Megan's just Megan. gonna like twitch this entire <laughs> lecture. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Where? She also has more personality than the host. Well, oh yeah. Damn. Isadora Duncan was what kind of performer? A dancer. A crackhead. Isadora. Dancer. Isadora Duncan was a dancer and a choreographer. Nice. Yeah, so you were actually right. Okay. He's seen this before. With a name uh, like Isadora. Ahead, Home economics for seventh. Home economics is seventh. Which is the best dietary source of calcium? Milk, oranges, or mushrooms? Shrooms, okay. man. Okay, Megan? Milk. Milk is correct. There's body good. Hey, Megan, uh, you're still in control here. Um, current events for elementary. Current events. Elementary. Oh, no. Oh, we gotta get Megan. Megan that's to one stop. of our loose squares. You're gonna have to uh, put one. Oh, we need to stop Megan. She's too. Op she's Megan, too op. Megan, she's running that table. Megan, she has all the answers. <laughs> <laughs>